رب العالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى اقترب للناس حسابهم وهم في غفلة معرضون وقال الله تبارك وتعالى اقتربت الساعة وانشق القمر وسئل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن الساعة فقال السائل متى الساعة يا رسول الله فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ماذا أعددت لها صدق الله وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين أما بعد Respected, most honorable listeners, beloved brothers, mothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh With the various advents and events that are folding both locally and globally we find that every one of us seated here perhaps may have uttered a statement or at the least we believe in this. So much so that even non-Muslims, people who believe in the divine, in any divine scripture for that matter, you would hear them also uttering the statement at times. And what is this? statement or what is this belief, very often we say that we are living very close to the end of time, <coughs> to Qiyamah or to Doomsday. Yeah. And the reason for that is because we are seeing the signs, rule and oppression has reached its pinnacle, technology has reached such levels that are unimaginable. The signs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that were mentioned in various ahadith are glaring and staring in our faces. In fact, these signs of Qiyamah are not something that are new to the Summah. With the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to this world as a Nabi, that was already the first sign of Qiyamah where our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned on one occasion Ana was sa'atu kahatain that my coming to this world as a prophet and Qiyamah are as close as these two fingers that is the middle finger and the index finger when it is put together how close these are and this is generally this gesture is generally used to show the closeness of certain things. So we understand from this that the closeness of Qiyamah was already indicated to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, اِقْدَرَبَتِ السَّاعَةُ وَانْشَقَ الْقَبَرُ Qiyamah is close. And one of the signs of that is the splitting of the moon. The splitting of the moon which took place in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Over and above that, there are so many ahadith of our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enumerates the various signs of Qiyamah. For example, the famous hadith Jibreel. Wherein Jibreel alayhi salam asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Maja sa'a? When is Qiyamah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded and said Man mas'oolu anha bi'a'lama min as-sa'il That the one who is asking the question and the one who is being asked are equal in terms of the fact that both of us 
do not have knowledge of when Qiyamah will take place. The next question that Jibreel alayhi salam asked, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنْ إِمَارَاتِهَا Then tell me about some of the signs of Qiyamah. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enumerated some of the signs of Qiyamah. For example, أَنْ تَلِدَ الْأَمَةُ رَبَّتَهَا When you see that a slave girl is giving birth to her master. Of course, there is no slavery now. But if you analyze the statement of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you place it onto today's parental relationships, parents and children, you'll understand it that we are seeing these signs of qiyamah. A, ma a slave giving birth to the master, what does that mean? That the master is supposed to be giving the instructions and the slave ought to be obeying the instructions. But when the roles are swapped, then it is as though the master, uh, the slave is giving the instructions and the master is taking instructions. If we take this, parable of Rasulullah wasallam's hadith and place it onto parental relationships. We see exactly what Rasulullah wasallam has said, that children are giving birth to their parents. In which way? Children are giving instruction and parents are taking instruction. Children are in authority, parents are in a position where they are being ruled by the children. And you can understand this very well. We are not going to talk about those very dire circumstances. We are going to talk about a situation where, alhamdulillah, there is deen in the home. Parents are reading salah. There is some form of deen. Even in those homes, you will find and compare this situation to perhaps the middle aged people and the elderly people will be able to relate to the older generation. Parents decided everything about the child, the education, what the child will study, the marriage, which school the child will attend, which university, what the child will do. Everything was decided by parents and children went with the flow. Today, compare that to today's situation. Children are deciding what they are going to wear how they are going to dress, which places they are going to frequent, who they are going to befriend, where they are going to study, what they are going to study. Marital issues, it is a no-go. They decide and they come with their partners. Perhaps the younger generation cannot relate to this, but the older generation will relate to this. Who decided about the marriage? Who decided about the partners? Everything was decided by the parents. Today's circumstances are such where kids and children are giving ultimatums to their parents. They are giving their parents options. In the past, there were no options given to children. The decision was taken by parents. Now, children are giving their parents options. How many times we find and we, we come across this situation where parents will say, you know, I'm scared to say this to my child because my child will stop speaking to me. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that? A child stops speaking to the parents. A few decades ago, that was something unheard about. Parents are scared to discipline or even tell their children, do this or do not do that. Even give advice because my child will become upset with me and my child will not come and visit me and my child will keep my grandchildren away from me. A common thing. May Allah protect us. <laughs> Children are giving birth to the parents. In other words, they have assumed the role of parents and parents have assumed the role of children. That was the first sign. The second sign Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as if Rasulullah is telling us this now because we are seeing it with our eyes. Rasulullah says that you will see those individuals who are they do not have 
shoes to wear, or they choose not to wear shoes. And they are not clad sufficiently. They do not have sufficient clothes, or they choose not to dress fully. Who is this referring to? This is referring to the shepherds, the Aashah, those shepherds who are tending to the sheep in the deserts of the Middle East. You will see them doing what? يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ Allahu Akbar. You will see them vying with each other in building the highest burj and the highest uh, towers, Zamzam or Burj Khalifa, or what you want to name it. As if we are seeing it with our eyes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, those shepherds who did not even have sufficient clothing, who did not even have shoes, and now they are vying with each other, and we find that the Middle East has turned into a concrete jungle. Other ahadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speak about rains in the deserts, something that was unheard of. And that is why we find so much of flooding today in the Middle East when you get those rains. And not just ordinary rains, storms, destructive rains, torrential rains. Because those countries never catered for drainage because there was no rain. And today they are sitting with a problem. How often we are seeing the floods, the severe rains, and those deserts are turning into green, lush lands. This was indicated by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are seeing it with our eyes. So these are some of the signs that we have seen over time. But what we are seeing today, currently, or perhaps in the last decade, this is precisely what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had mentioned, that before Qiyamah, you will see the signs of Qiyamah, like the, th the, like the beads of a thread. You know, in our understanding, a tasbih, that you read tasbih on. If you snap that thread, or if that thread breaks, how those bees will start falling off that thread one by one, one after the other. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you will see the signs of qiyamah unfolding just like that, one after the other. You will not be able to contend and put up with one sign, and the next sign will also already be staring in your face. We are hardly prepared to deal with the issue of LGBTQ, and here we find feminism facing us. We are hardly prepared to deal with that, and you find COVID facing us. You are hardly prepared to deal with that, and you find modernism facing us, liberalism facing, uh, facing us. All of this fitnas are unfolding just like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, like the beads on the thread that are falling one by one, one after the other. So these are the signs of Qiyamah. And it is because of this that perhaps every one of us believes, like I said in the beginning, that we are living close to the end of time. And we make the statement, we utter this from time to time, that Qiyamah is very near, Qiyamah is very close. So, the hadith that I mentioned in the beginning, a sahabi asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, Mata al-Sa'a. Oh, Messenger of Allah, where is Qiyamah? So at that point, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt it befitting to respond to this companion of his with a rhetorical question. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not tell him that when you see this, then no Qiyamah is near. When you see the coming of the Mahdi, when you see the sun rising from the west, when you see the Jal. At that point, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt it appropriate and a lesson for us relevant to our discussion today. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt it appropriate to divert his attention to something more important. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him on his question, he asked, when is Qiyamah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, Mala a'adabta laha? What have you prepared for Qiyamah? You are asking about when is Qiyamah? The bigger question, the more relevant question is, what have you prepared for Qiyamah? And you and I know, we are believing that Qiyamah is on our doorstep, considering the fact 
that we are 1446 years away from the time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ana was sa'atu kahatain, that I and Qiyamah are so close. Considering the fact that we are witnessing the signs of Qiyamah unfolding before us, just like the bees are falling of the thread. Considering the fact that we are seeing zulm and oppression has reached levels that were never ever witnessed and experienced before. So we know that Qiyamah is so close. What have we prepared for Qiyamah? What are we preparing for Qiyamah? You know, today sometimes, very often, we get too carried away with conspiracy theories. Whether it was a COVID, whether it is what is happening right now in the land of Sham, you know, the different theories, why is this war being prolonged? And the Prime Minister, so-called Prime Minister of Israel, is prolonging this war because he knows that his political career comes to an end at the end, at the end of this war. Those are all conspiracy theories. In the eyes of Allah, this is a plan that is unfolding. But the point is, the point I'm making is that we get too carried away with these conspiracy theories and with why and when America's dollar will collapse so that will weaken Israel and that will bring the end to the war and that will give the Palestinians or the people of Gaza or the people of Jerusalem, the Muslims, it will give them the freedom, it will return the land. We get carried away with all of those things and we forget that we have to be preparing for the Akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah does not complain. Who complains? A person who's in a weaker position. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us aware, makes a statement in the Quran as if Allah is complaining about us. The Quran was revealed again 1446 years ago. And that time Allah is saying that the day of Hisab the day of accountability for people, for you and I, has come so close. <laughs> Yet we find that insan is in total oblivion. He is averse. He is indifferent to the fact that I will stand before Allah and I will be held accountable for my deeds and my actions. We have become oblivious. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us these reminders time and again. It is a pity that insan does not take nasiha, does not derive advice from the reminders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah complains about this as well in the Quran, about the Quraysh of Makkah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the 11th juz, أَوَلَا يَرَوْنَا أَنَّهُمْ يُفْتَنُونَ فِي كُلِّ عَامٍ مَرَّةً أَوْ مَرَّتَيْنِ ثُمَّ لَا يَتُوبُونَ وَلَا هُمْ يَذَّكَّرُونَ The Quraysh of Makkah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send them reminders time and again. Sometimes once a year, sometimes twice a year. What kinds of reminders? Sometimes in the form of a flood. Sometimes in the form of uh, a drought. Sometimes in the form of an earthquake. Sometimes in the form of internal fighting. Whatever the reminders may be, Allah is saying we send them these reminders over and over again. But still you will find that the people are not making tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Neither are they taking nasiha and advice from the reminders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So while this was revealed for the Quraysh of Makkah, the reason Allah mentioned it in the Quran is for us to measure ourselves against the same verse of the Quran. Is Allah not sending us reminders over and over again? Are we taking nasiha from the reminders of Allah? Are we like the Quraysh of Makkah? Are we ignoring the reminders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We are not going to go far back. You know, 2011 was what they call the Arab Spring, the uprising in various Middle Eastern countries. That was a sign from Allah. We are not going to go as far back as that. Let us go as far back as four to five years ago. Every one of us experienced what was known as COVID. Every one of us. And at that time, death stared in the face of every individual and every moment. Nobody knew. Every one of us experienced what in our families, close relatives or extended family, somebody or the other who was a healthy man, a healthy woman today, 
And tomorrow at this time they were down in their cover. Suddenly they took ill and they were gone. We all witnessed it. We all, and that shook humanity at large. We will find at that time, and you can ask the ulama, you can ask the organizations, we, myself personally, how many phone calls we got from people, you know, Molina, please help us, we need to drop our world. Death is so uncertain, life is so uncertain. We are witnessing people dying in our families. You know, we need to be prepared for them. We had this. There was a shift in our focus of life. People were now realizing the reality of death. People were realizing that death can come at any time, any moment, unannounced. And people realized this. I had a student of mine, youngster. I met him during those days somewhere. I cannot remember where it was, but anyway. <coughs> And I asked him, what's your dream of your life? What's the plans going forward? And he said, no, these were my ideas. You know, I wanted to go to study at university and go and do this and that. But he said, you know what, Maulana, after we're witnessing what we are witnessing, I really feel it's not worth doing any of that. I'd rather focus on my after. During the time you will know and I know of nikah that took place, those were nikah that were the closest to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Were the least expenditure. The most simplest of nikah that took place, took place at that time. Whether it was out of voluntarily or involuntarily, but the reality is even our nikah became simple. So much so that even funerals, janazas, became so simple. Like I mentioned earlier, a man was with us today, perfectly fine, normal, walking, reading salah with us in the masjid. The next day at the same time he was in his cover. We did not even know. Janaza took place, burial took place, and the person was buried. Now take that time, which was not long ago. Every one of us secretly experienced that. And look at our situation today. That time there was a total shift in the focus. Even people who were studying, who were learning about the signs of Qiyamah, the coming of the Jal, people who were studying about the end of times, we will find so many people were focused towards the Akhirah. But the good thing and the fortunate thing is that COVID went. But the unfortunate thing is that COVID took our mindset again with it. And today we find ourselves back to square one. Look at our weddings today. Back to square one. Months before we are booking a hall, perhaps we are paying 30, 40, 50, 70,000. I may be off the mark. It could be much more, but definitely not less than that. Just for a few hours, we are booking a hall for the wedding. Look at the build up towards the wedding. All the different ideologies and cultures we have brought into the sacred institute of Nikah. Nikah, which is a, a, an institute of blessings. Nikah, which has the blessings of Allah and His Rasul. But we have brought Hollywood, we have brought Bollywood, we have brought everything anti-Islam into our Nikah. You know, we have the men's night, we have the ladies' night, we have the men night. Those very same people who are massacring our Muslim brothers and sisters in India, those Hindus, we have brought their culture of Mendi night into our nikah. Then we have a Brahe night. And then at the end of the whole week, we make Allah also happy. Thursday night is Khatam night. We have a Khatam. Even our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not see the need to have a Khatam night, but we bring it in. So all of this, where does it fit into our deen? Leave alone the wedding itself. We are not going to go. We can spend another half an hour discussing the wedding itself. The occasion of nikah. Nikah has been taken out of masajid. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, A'alinu hadha nikah waj'aluhu fil masajid. Have your nikah in the masjid. We have taken it to the venues. That same venue where the week before or the week after the Yahud and the Nasara and the Kuffar will be having dancing and alcohol. We have taken the sacred nikah into that venue. Whereas we could have had it, and why? For the sake of convenience. Just for convenience. We are depriving ourselves of all of these blessings. 
So this is one example. Our marriage, our, our funerals, unfortunately, it is so sad to say, but the haq has to be said, and it has to be said how it has to be said. Our mayor houses today, look at them. Barely five, six hours after the marhum, marhumah has been buried, the blood is still hot in the body of the mayor in the qabr. And you go to the mayor house, you will think there was a wedding that took place. You will think that there was some party that took place. People are rejoicing, people are laughing, as if there's no janaza that took place. Subhanallah, even our mayors today, when we cater for the guests who are coming to pay respects, we have to make sure that even our chairs are draped, even for the mayor. The tablecloth has to be matching, even for the funeral. The, uh, the, the, the dishes that we are serving have to be matching. It has become more like a party, more like a, a, an occasion of celebration than an occasion where we should be reflecting about our own death. So the point that I am driving and I conclude with this is that we know we are close to Qiyamah. We believe in it. Many of us utter the statement, when is the Mahdi coming? Because we know the only savior of, of the Ummah will be the Mahdi. So we say, when is the Mahdi coming? Are we prepared for the moment when the Mahdi comes? Are we pre am I prepared? The Mahdi is going to come, he's going to play a certain role. And let me quickly explain that role of the Mahdi to you in less than a minute. Our perception of the Mahdi is perhaps that he will come, he will go to the land of Gaza, he will destroy uh, the so-called entity known as Zionism of Israel, and he will liberate the people of Gaza and the people of the land of Sham. Perhaps then somebody will tell him that, you know, you go to India, the BJP party is oppressing the Muslims. He will go to India and destroy the BJP party and liberate the Muslims and tell the Muslims of India, right, you live happily ever after. Then somebody may tell him, you know, you need to go to China. The Uyghur Muslims are being oppressed. Go and destroy the Chinese government. He will go and destroy and he will establish the Islamic uh, whatever, you know. Uh, he will liberate the people of China. And then he will come to South Africa. And he will see, mashallah, this is a very good ummah here in South Africa. They've got masajid, they've got darul rooms, they've got maktabs, they have uh, freedom of religion. So they think they have freedom of religion. They will tell the Muslims of South, uh, uh, South Africa, mashallah, you live your lives as you are living. This is not the role of the Mahdi. That is not the role of the Mahdi. The role of the Mahdi is he will return the Ummah and this world to a Khilafah system ala min hajin nubuwa, as it was in the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the times after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Are we prepared to fit into that system, into that Khilafah system? That is the question. We will be prepared for that when we are prepared to meet Allah. We will be prepared for that when we are prepared to for the Akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability and the understanding as a Muslim Ummah what role we play. We play a pivotal role in that we are the da'wah for the disbelievers. The disbelievers are looking at us. When they see we are oblivious to the Akhirah, they will believe there is no Akhirah because if these are people who believe in the Akhirah but they are not scared about preparing for the Akhirah, that means there is no Akhirah coming anytime soon. So we have to play that role where for our own selves and as a da'wah for humanity out there, we have to become those people who are the custodians of the ruh, of the deen, of the Qur'an, and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah grant myself and each one of us the ability and the topic and the understanding. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa baraka ala